Welcome to EarthBeat on the Real News Network. I'm Daphne Weisham. As we enter a new round of debates on the federal budget, once again, members of Congress propose major cuts to the EPA. Joining us to discuss the history of environmental protection and new ways to stimulate the economy are Brent Blackwelder and Bill Drayton. Brent Blackwelder is the President Emeritus of Friends of the Earth and has served as an environmental advocate for over 40 years. Bill Drayton was the Assistant Administrator at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency under President Jimmy Carter. Bill is currently Chair and CEO of Ashoka, an organization focusing on social entrepreneurship. So welcome to EarthBeat, both of you. Thank you. So, uh, Bill Drayton and Brent Blackwelder. Both of you have been in Washington, D.C. for going on four decades. You've seen a lot of changes. You've seen the Environmental Protection Agency under attack. You've seen uh, environmental groups come and go. Um, so perhaps what we're going through right now is nothing new, but I wonder, starting with you, Bill, if you could sort of uh, reflect on your time, because you were actually working at the EPA under President Carter. Um, Tell us about what what was going on in, in, under under President Carter in terms of his energy and environmental agenda, and uh, what you've seen happen with regard to the EPA since then. Well, that was a wonderful time of creation. This is our, our society realized that we had man-made pollutants, toxics in the environment, and over four years. 14 major statutes were passed to deal with that. It was the second major wave of public health legislation in the nation's history. Uh, it was also a wonderful time at the EPA. Um, it had been founded uh, five, six years before, so it had come together. It had Under a, Nixon? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Right. Um, and at that point, there was a huge consensus. The mm -hmm. country really wanted to get this job done. Mm -hmm. And President Carter really understood. Returning to President Carter, because, I, you know, people in some ways, they make fun of him, his fireside chats and uh, the sweaters and, you know, lowering the thermostat to 68 degrees and the solar panels on the White House. And yet he really was in many ways trying to convey a sense of urgency about the energy crisis. This was the 1970s when there were long lines at gas stations. Um, so, so Carter managed to make some changes, but what you're suggesting is then Reagan, President Reagan, undid quite a few of those, correct? Well, if you look at the environmental field, there is no time in the country's history that we've made more progress because we dealt with toxics. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for us to even imagine what it was like before that. Uh, environmental protection was dealing with very simple, mainly natural pollutants, particulates are partly man-made, partly artificial. Then we realized there were thousands, hundreds of thousands of man-made, Latin-named, invisible, and very dangerous things that no one had done any testing on. And even today, 90% uh, have not been tested for their impact on us. And where they have been tested, they've been tested for the few things that we can test for relatively easy, easily. So cancer, but not uh, behavioral or genetic effects. So this was a huge watershed, and the country started down the path of dealing with toxics in air and water and hazardous transportation all those laws were passed, and we were just getting to the point where you had to implement them. We were spent much of the four years getting the legislation through and designing the implementation. Uh, and it was a, uh, a very dramatic time. The OMB, the President's Budget Office, calculated that the EPA workload in their calculus had more than doubled because it had taken on this new workload. The, just to give you a sense of the transition to Reagan, his intent was to cut the agency by two-thirds within the first 12 to 14 months through, so it didn't look so big at any one time, a series of 10, 20 percent cuts planned one right after the other. So if you double the workload and you cut the agency by two-thirds, there is no intent to deal with toxics or even the conventional pollutants. And it was, and, and this is what we're seeing again today. 
People don't say we're attacking clean air. We're dealing with budgetary and management matters. But there is a real policy purpose behind it. Mm -hmm. Maybe not one based on an understanding of what the real consequences are, because I don't think people are intentionally harmful. But they're caught in an ideology. They're caught in a generational gap that some people just still don't understand the science. Mm -hmm. Because you've been, you've been around Washington in, in many ways looking at it from, from the outside in, looking at uh, the environmental crisis from the position of a non-governmental organization. You right. were president of Friends of the Earth. You've uh, certainly been involved in, in scores of other environmental organizations. Tell us what you've, you've witnessed over the last 40 years uh, up to the present in terms of, in terms of the sense of urgency, uh, the sense of uh, the, the need for activism. Uh, Bill mm -hmm. mentioned all of these pollutants that we don't yes, even have a exactly. sense of, mm -hmm. of what their impacts mm -hmm. are on the human body, and mm -hmm. yet uh, we're talking about cuts now, again. Exactly. I want to just fill in on what Bill said for the entire decade of the 70s. Yes, mm -hmm. we had the great four years with, with President Jimmy Carter doing mm -hmm. wonderful things, but that decade was a one of bipartisanship, mm -hmm. and that enabled the passage of 30 environmental laws. I know from the fact Friends Dirty. of the Earth has 76 uh, affiliates around the world that worldwide the United States was looked to as the nation huh. taking the initiative to control and deal with pollution of air and water and land and that we set an environmental framework that was to be emulated. But what's happened, and you can mark this with the election of Ronald Reagan, was the reversal. We were poised at the end of that decade to lead the world on clean energy. At the end of the 70s. At the end of that decade, mm -hmm. the end of the 70s, uh, and mm -hmm. Jimmy Carter had put those solar collectors on the White House. Ronald Reagan removed them. Mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan preached the theme, government is evil. Government can't solve problems. Mm -hmm. Government is in the way. Government is too big. Mm -hmm. and, and yet Congress had said there are all these important things that we are going to do, and we were respected worldwide. What's happened is that erosion has occurred every decade since. So that uh, under this past decade in the 21st century, with Bush Jr. behaving in the same way that Ronald Reagan did, government is evil theme, uh, cutbacks, non-enforcement, we have gone from the most respected and emulated power to one that is the most detested as the anchor on progress in making the planet a healthier place to live. So that is the challenge. We could have been the leader on clean energy in the 80s if we'd had a different president. Mm -hmm. We had the capability, but instead mm -hmm. it was Germany, it was Spain, it was Denmark. Mm -hmm. These countries took the initiative on solar and wind and got results, mm -hmm. even though the United States has far greater wind and solar resources than any of those countries or all of them combined. So we lost that potential. Mm -hmm. Now we are not poised to be a great nation, and under these, these cuts proposed by the, by the Republican leadership, supported by the Tea Party, we are going to go backwards instead of forwards with a vision and having America once again as a great champion of a healthy planet. Bill, do you agree with that? Is it, is it, really, is it really sort of a Republican-Democrat issue? Uh, I mean, for example, President Clinton, did he make great strides in terms of uh, advancing an agenda uh, that would have restored integrity and strength to the EPA? Or is it really sort of an, an ideology that had begun to take hold regardless of party affiliation by the 1990s? I think there is a deeper problem, and that is that the environmental movement, our field, has a very weak political base. Mm -hmm. It's very broad. Everyone wants clean air, clean water. They don't want toxics in their food. Mm -hmm. But that's everyone. And what environmental regulation does is it asks people to do things that they are not voluntarily doing, which makes them angry. It and asks polluters to do things. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the people mm -hmm. that are being asked to clean up the power plants, you know, you go through the industries, mm -hmm. they're very organized. And when you have a highly organized force confronted with a highly 
distributed, not organized force. Even with the best efforts of the environmental leadership like Brett, you have a political imbalance. And so Richard Nixon came to office when the public was outraged and demanded mm -hmm. action. Mm -hmm. uh, he took action. Mm -hmm. He was a Republican, as mm -hmm. Brent was saying. I've experienced this at the state level. I've seen a Republican do a good job, Mayor Lindsay, followed by Mayor Beam in New York, disaster. On environment. But on environment, mm -hmm. same thing, Mescal Republican, replaced by Grasso Democrat mm -hmm. in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And then in Ohio, the other way around, mm -hmm. Gilligan to Rhodes. In all cases, you had people who took initiative for the environment, followed by a very negative reaction. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so back to your issue of, of the power base and being, being uh, broad but not deep, uh, and the polluters being well organized. I would assume that that's also at play in countries like Germany, in countries like uh, Spain, uh, and yet somehow these countries have signed on to the Kyoto Protocol. These countries have managed to get major legislation passed uh, in terms of enhancing their renewable energy uptake. What's different? I don't know if either of you would Well, I mean, on one, one thing in Germany, because you have proportional representation, a third party can, can mm. demand some real clout. Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. the Greens are controlling 5, 10, 15 percent, then they have to be involved or you can't form a government. Mm -hmm. And unlike the situation in the United States, third parties don't usually do that well. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, the other point is, as Bill said, the environmental movement has been apolitical, thinking, well, our lofty goals of clean air and clean water, we just articulate them and, and naturally mm -hmm. everybody will agree. Well, it gets down to if you are not working to put good, conscientious people in the office at every level, mm -hmm. then the money that is growing increasingly important is mm -hmm. going to drive mm -hmm. people into office that are beholden to particular contributors, largely the major polluters. Mm -hmm. who actually make a good investment because if you look at the amount of subsidies and handouts they get from the government, then they are richly rewarded. A few thousands of dollars spent here results in millions and even billions in mm -hmm. friendly provisions in the tax code. And of course we've got the recent Supreme Court decision, Citizens United decision, that has in many ways handed even more power to the corporations. Do you agree with, with Brent's assessment in terms of uh, why it is that uh, perhaps that uh, in countries like Germany where there's a, a Green Party as a, as a countervailing force that that might be what's at play or is it is it corporate power? What is it? Well the politics of each country varies. I mean right now China is making most of the world's growth in pollution but also the most remarkable investments in clean energy because mm -hmm. they see it as important both environmentally and economically. Mm -hmm. They would like to dominate this industry. I, I said, what do we do about this? Um, I, I think we have to broaden the political base that supports the environment. Mm -hmm. We have learned mm -hmm. over several decades now that what happens is you get to a crisis point, the public is mobilized, action happens, and then you have a, a long period of attrition mm -hmm. where we're on the defensive all the time. Mm -hmm. So how do we broaden the base? Uh, well, I think we have to be allied with other issues. And there's a very simple way of doing that. The biggest job that the current government has and will have for some time is jobs. Mm -hmm. Jobs affect almost everyone. Mm -hmm. And here you can see the alliance between the environment and all these other groups. No one planned this, but payroll taxes have gone from 1% to 17% of payrolls. And mm -hmm. from the case, in, in terms of federal revenues, they've gone from 1% now to 40%. So it's almost equal with the income tax. Mm -hmm. Between the two of them, you have 80% of federal revenues. No one planned that, but that's a huge price signal. It says, don't employ people and do use natural resources, because that's the trade-off, mm -hmm. people versus things. That's the most fundamental price signal in the economy. Now, if you were to take off the 17% payroll taxes, 
and put 12-13% on things, natural resources, materials, energy, etc., you'd have a 30% price signal. That's a big price signal. That's worth 40 million full-time, good, new, permanent jobs, and there's no debt. And it, you get huge environmental benefits because one of the things that we're doing is instead of reusing and repairing, we're throwing away. We've got, we're treating the planet as if it were a business and a liquidation sale. Whereas if we're doing what Bill says, shifting the taxes onto pollution and onto extraction of raw resources, then you've got the replacement revenue, and in so doing, you can lower the payroll tax, and there are the jobs. It's a win-win situation all around. However, President Clinton did attempt to impose a BTU tax uh, when he was first. In fact, it was one of his first uh, first initiatives, correct? And that was not very well received. Well, it, are, well but, what you're what you're proposing is something. Somewhat different, yes, but, but there is that that is there is that memory of well, that negative but, experience. But that was not well prepared, and and but people forget it passed the House and mm -hmm. was one vote short, uh, or would have passed the Senate because mm -hmm. Senator Bourne of Oklahoma, with all the oil lobby, chose not to report it mm -hmm. out of committee. Otherwise, mm -hmm. that very modest uh, the way it ultimately came out could have happened. Mm -hmm. It would have been a broad based signal on uh, that we're putting a price on on. Uh, uh, carbon and mm -hmm. on energy use, it would have helped us uh, mm -hmm. uh, make, start making some changes, would that we had done it. Mm -hmm. But all of the money went in from the big oil industry mm -hmm. to say, oh, this is an awful idea. Mm -hmm. Not that it's a great idea, that mm -hmm. it will help with employment, it will make our air and water cleaner. But here we are, here, fast forward to today. The well, price of oil the, the point, is, is I, going through the roof. Uh, people are complaining about this. They're realizing that you know instability in Libya is directly connected to their pocketbooks. How could we begin to phase in a price on carbon under the current situation where the price of oil, who knows how high it's going to go? I think the main reason that the BTU tax, tax didn't pass is that it was a green tax. It wasn't a jobs tax. It wasn't something that was critical for older people and younger people and immigrants and all the interests mm. that when you build an alliance, you have a different political Dynamic. reality. Mm -hmm. uh, the environment alone has, I think it's an inaccurate decision, but the environmental community has said, we can't get green taxes, and so we don't invest energy in them anymore. But when you create an alliance mm -hmm. with older people, women, people with disability, young people, people who've been institutionalized, immigrants, minorities, and virtually all of business, not to mention labor. Labor doesn't do very well when you have a huge overhang of people who want jobs and can't get it. Mm -hmm. That's an alliance that is, it is overwhelmingly powerful. If we build that mm -hmm. alliance, we get real impact mm -hmm. on jobs and environment mm -hmm. and it's on a political base it's very mm -hmm. hard to turn around and, and even some of the, some conservatives have said no these are harm harm charges are okay if, if you you harm charges harm charges on pollution it's like a sin tax mm -hmm. and it's okay that's that's not raising my income tax mm -hmm. so they actually some of them distinguish and they're okay with that in fact the key thing now is people have got to look at revenue sources. They, they aren't going to go deal, as they're proposing to do, with budget deficits or the overall national debt by simply scrapping all foreign aid or destroying EPA. Th that is s relatively small amounts of money. They have got to look, if they want to restore America to leadership rule, look at getting some revenue. And you can get it by doing exactly the things that Bill was describing, because you get the revenue and you get a jobs component if you do this. There's $200 billion to be obtained uh, in, in savings over the next f four to five years. If you 200 billion. 200 billion. Remember, the Republicans are trying to cut 100 billion, and they're having trouble getting it without some draconian measures that are unpopular. I'm talking about stopping the subsidies that are going to big oil companies, to big coal companies, to big nuclear power industries, to the corn ethanol operatives, if you, if you put those things together, 
you you sh you come up with approximately 200 billion in savings. You have to throw in a few boondoggle projects fr from the highway guys mm -hmm. and from the Army Corps mm -hmm. of Engineers on rivers, and there you've got it. However, the argument against cutting payroll taxes is Social Security, correct? I mean, Social Security, the, the, the revenue for Social Security in large part comes from the payroll tax. So if you cut that, how do we, at a time of, of crisis for Social Security, how do we replenish well, those the, funds? The, the core problem that Social Security has, we've gone from 34 workers supporting one retired person to two supporting one, and the trend mm. is still mm. very negative. Mm. As long as there are fewer and fewer workers supporting people who are beneficiaries, Social Security is in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. So you shift to a tax base that is growing, mm -hmm. that has increased mm -hmm. value. You've changed, you've taken mm -hmm. away the main risk. The other big risk for Social Security, which we are certainly experiencing now, is that as long as America feels poorer and poorer, we want to cut taxes to maintain consumption. Mm -hmm. um, we have a country that's divided. We don't work together because everyone is defending their piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. That makes our economy rigid. It makes it really hard to get the support to increase what we're spending, which we could do if there was a, a sort of a dividend from a bigger economy and lower expenditures mm -hmm. on environment, that's a big part of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're trying to cut $100 billion because the economy is in trouble and we have this, I think, false paradigm that it's either we're going to cut debt or we're going to have more employment or both, I mean, that's just... just mm -hmm. We're, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks for joining us. And thank you for joining us on EarthBeat. On The Real News Network, I'm Daphne Weisham.